in the New Testament scriptures, Colossians chapter 4. Coming into the final section of this letter, final chapter, wrapping up Paul's instructions here in chapters 3 and 4, moving into the final verses. So chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 2 through 6, Colossians chapter 4. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we pray for your help in the reading and preaching of the word. Without you, we can do nothing. Open the eyes of our hearts and give us understanding. The entrance of your word bringeth light. As we considered earlier in the Sunday school hour, the natural man cannot comprehend the things of God, but by means of the Spirit, you enable us to discern spiritual truths. As the words are read, as these words are proclaimed, Lord, would you work to give us understanding. Convert those who are outside of Christ. Give them spiritual understanding of the gospel, perhaps for the first time ever. And Lord, build up your people. Teach us more of your truth and give us hearts that are obedient and thankful for what you tell us in your word and make much of your son. May Jesus Christ be central to our considerations this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Last winter, during our Wednesday night Bible studies, one of the topics that we looked at was an overview of church history. And it was an overview indeed. We did about three centuries every Wednesday night. So 300 years and about 30 minutes is a quick pace. So we were moving indeed in an overview fashion. But one of the people we looked at was an early Christian theologian by the name of Augustine of Hippo. He's often referred to as Saint Augustine or Saint Augustine in much conversation. He ministered and lived in North Africa. He was the kind of pastor who studied deeply, thought deeply, and wrote prolifically, so much so that his writings are still influential to this day. So in his own day, he, he was well known and he was very helpful. So for example, when the city of Rome fell to the Visigoth invaders in 410, this was the collapse of society in the Western world and great darkness and anarchy. And during that event, Augustine wrote the book known as The City of God, a book that encourages Christians to labor for the city that God is building, for the city that can never fail, for the eternal, heavenly, spiritual city, which will never be thwarted. So he was a minister to to people's needs in his own day. And he also wrote books on the Trinity, combating ancient heresies, and he wrote books on the sovereignty of God and salvation. And those are, especially those writings, on God's sovereignty and salvation, again, continue to influence us to this day. Much of what we believe as Presbyterians, what is recorded in our creed and confession of faith, was influenced by Augustine's writings and teachings as he explained the Scripture. So he's he's a big deal in church history. But what you may not know is that Augustine did not become a Christian until he was 31. You may think was such a successful uh, career, so to speak. He must have just been working from the earliest days, a good Christian growing up. No, he didn't become a Christian until he was 31, and he was quite the rebel in his own day. He and his friends went stealing pears, not because they were hungry, but because they just thought stealing was fun. In fact, after they stole the pears, they let them rot because they weren't that hungry to begin with. Augustine was a pagan. His mother, however, was a Christian, a Christian who cared very deeply for his soul. His father was a pagan, though, and said, you will not raise these children as Christians. 
You may not have them baptized. You will not bring them up in the Christian faith. And that broke his mother's heart. So she did about the only thing she could do. She prayed earnestly for her children, often with tears. So much so that one priest once told her, the child of those tears shall never perish. So intent was she in praying for her son. She was very devout. In fact, one time Augustine tricked her. I think as he was getting into his 20s, his father had died and his mother insisted on accompanying him on a trip. And he, knowing her to be very devout, said, well, mom, let's go into this church and pray before we take this sea voyage. And so they went and did that, and Augustine snuck out and got on the boat and left his mother praying in church. So kids then were about as bad as they were, as they are today. But in time, those prayers were answered, and Augustine became a Christian. Now, I tell you this story for this very simple reason. Very often in the history of Christianity, you will have famous figures, well-known for their evangelistic work, their writing, their influential leadership, these great tasks that God gave people to do. But sometimes we forget that behind all of those figures were people who were faithful to pray for them. And that the private work of prayer, And the devotion to prayer that the people of God gave for the sake of those leaders is just as vital and just as important as what they did in public. And that's what Paul touches on in this passage. He says the same thing in these verses. So as we come to them this morning, I want us to look at what he says about prayer. And particularly, what he says about praying for the ministry praying for those who are tasked with preaching the word of God. Verses 5 and 6 are more addressed at how we interact with outsiders, with unbelievers, with non-Christians, and we will come to those verses next week. This morning, I just want to look at verses 2, 3, and 4 and see what Paul says about prayer. What role does prayer play in a Christian life? And let me remind you just one more time, again of the context, Here we are talking about since we are in union with Christ, since we died and rose with Christ and we're free from any man-made system of spirituality, how then do we live for the Lord? How do we live out our heavenly life? We've looked at it in general, how we deal with, how we deal with lying, how we deal with the use of our lips, how we deal with forgiveness, how we deal with church. We got very specific in looking at the Christian home. And then this topic deals under the same general idea. What does it look like since we are in Christ? How does that affect how we pray? And I want us to look then at that today. And I've structured it just around three questions, three simple questions. Number one, why is prayer so important? I don't think I need to tell you it's important. I think we know that. It's just one of those things we've read enough Bible to know that prayer is important, that it's something we should do. It's something we do whenever we meet as a congregation. Why is prayer so important? Paul emphasizes it, of course, in verse 2 where he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And I think it's good to understand kind of right up front, this is a challenge. Paul is challenging us here with reference to prayer. He's not just giving a general encouragement. Hey, pray every now and then. This is a strong admonition to fervent prayer. And I say that because the word translated devote, it means to continue to do something with effort despite difficulty to persevere in something even when it gets hard. We're moving into the fall season. Football is resuming. People are practicing in the heat, and they're pushing through adversity for the sake of a goal. Paul is encouraging here to devote ourselves in a similar manner to prayer. Now, now don't be put off, by the way, and don't be embarrassed if you find that difficult. Paul knows we'll find it difficult. That's why he gives this admonition. You don't have to encourage people to do something when it is something that's easy to do. Paul knows that prayer can be difficult. He knows that that, that it's one of those things we may struggle to do. And thus he gives us this encouragement. One author even says prayer is a standard feature of the Christian life. Maybe you've purchased an automobile recently or in your history it came with certain standard features. Prayer is a standard feature of the Christian life. Therefore, something we should give ourselves to habitually 
and with perseverance. Now, having given that encouragement, why? Why is prayer so important? Well, the answer may surprise you. Christians should pray, not just because it's a duty. You ought to do it. Christians should pray because it is one of the means by which God's will takes place. I'll say that again. It is one of the means by which God's will takes place. And you say, well, wait a minute. I I thought God was sovereign. I thought we were Presbyterians here. I thought God does whatever he wants. Yes, he does. I don't dispute that for a moment. In the language of our confession, God has freely and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass. In other words, God has ordained the end of history from the beginning. He has ordained everything that happens, and his powerful hand guides history to those ends. That's how he can say, not even a sparrow falls apart from your heavenly Father. God works out everything that comes to pass, and he guides them to his own ends, according to the counsel of his own will. It's how he can tell us in Romans 8, that all things work together for good, For those who love him, God is sovereignly in control of those events. So God's sovereignty is not in question. But you know what our confession also teaches? That while God has ordained all things, he has also, quote, foreordained all the means thereunto. Now you know what that means? That means that God has not only ordained the what, he has also ordained the how. God has the end ordained, he has the events ordained, and he has also ordained all the little things that lead to those ends. And one of the means to those ends is prayer. Let me illustrate this just for a moment. You don't have to turn there. But in Revelation chapter 8, if you want to make a note of that, John sees a vision of the heavenly throne room. And he sees the seven angels ready to blow the seven trumpets. You've heard of the seven seals of Revelation? Well, now we're in the section where John sees the seven trumpets blown by seven angels. And as we've been considering on Sunday nights, those events, seals and trumpets, those are things taking place in heaven that cause things on earth to happen. Whenever a seal is opened in heaven, something happens on earth. Whenever a trumpet is blown in heaven, something happens on earth. So here we've got these seven trumpets and they're about to blow. Things are about to take place according to the will of God. But before they can blow their trumpets, another angel comes and he has incense in his hand and he places it on the heavenly altar. And we read that the incense goes up to God with the prayers of all God's people. In other words, this incense is a picture of prayer going up to God and being pleasing to him. And it's after the incense goes up that the angel takes fire and he throws it to the earth and then the seven angels prepare to blow their trumpets. What's the point of all that? The point is that the sovereign God Heaven's God, who is guiding history towards its ends, who is take, who is guiding everything according to his purpose, he acts in concert with prayer. He moves human history along, and he does it in interaction with the prayers of God's people. If you're coming Sunday night, you'll see there are few books of the Bible that give more attention to the sovereignty of God than the book of Revelation. And yet in that book, God works and his people pray and they take place together. Prayer is a means by which God's will takes place. Now, don't don't get me wrong. God does not have to use means. He's not bound by those means. He is free to work without above or against them as he pleases. There's nothing you and I can do or not do to thwart God. But at the same time, he often makes use of means. And one of those, one of the biggest ones, in fact, is prayer. The prayers of God's people. How all that works together may be a bit of a mystery to us, but it is what the scriptures teach. And sometimes people ask, well, 
If God is sovereign, why pray? I mean, if God's already ordained everything that's going to happen, what difference does prayer make? I think that's the wrong question. The question should be, if God isn't sovereign, then why pray? Because you could pray all day long, and you could pray fervently, but God really can't do anything until people make their choice, can he? But flip that around. If God has ordained the end, and if God has ordained the means, then not only are your prayers necessary, they are guaranteed to be effective. This is where God speaks to our heart when we say, I don't feel like my prayers are going anywhere. I feel like my prayers are a waste of time. No, God has said, this is my goal, and here's how we're going to get there. You're going to pray. And therefore, prayer is necessary, and God says, guess what? It will also work. It will do what I've promised it to do. That means when God says, Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. God really means that. It also means that when God says you do not have because you do not ask, he means it. Prayer advances as a part of accomplishing God's will. Before we leave this question, let me tell you a story. I heard a Christian named Chad Turner give his testimony recently, and he's like an Augustine, converted a little later in life in his college years after a rough college lifestyle. And in his story, he says that after he became a Christian, he visited a friend from high school because he remembered from his high school days, oh yeah, that guy was a Christian. So he called him up and he shared the good news. I've become a Christian. And the guy said, hey, let's meet up. And during their visit, Chad's friend said, I want to show you something. And he went and he got out a stack of old notebooks and he opened them. And inside, Chad could see his name written several times. You see, this friend, when he was in the seventh grade, their youth pastor challenged them. I want you to pick two people from your class who you think have no chance of ever becoming a Christian. And I want you to pray for them every week. And this young man flatteringly told Chad, you were one of the two that I picked. And he flipped through the notebook and he showed him page after page after page where he'd written his name and where he'd prayed for them. And now, in the sovereignty of God and God answering his prayers, Chad later became a Christian. Chad, by the way, today is preparing to be an RUF minister in our denomination. You never know what will happen when you pray. It is one of the ways that God advances his kingdom. That's why it's so important. Two, what kinds of things then do we pray for? Well, Paul gives us the answer here. In these verses, first he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful. Now, I bet you recognize that language. Sounds like the Garden of Gethsemane, does it not? Where Jesus said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's very similar to what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When we pray, we are watchful for our souls. We are aware of the times in which we live. We are aware that Christ could come soon. And so we're watchful and we're alert. And we pray, God, protect us from temptation. Grant us perseverance in the faith. Keep our souls safe. So part of prayer is being aware of of the need of spiritual health. Secondly, Paul says, we pray with thankfulness. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And if you go back and reread Colossians Thankfulness has come up several times. It's a very constant theme, uh, mentioned four or five times in what is, quite frankly, a short book. Why so much emphasis on thankfulness? Well, it's not just thankfulness in general. It's thankfulness for all that we have in Christ. One author writes, A true appreciation of the believer's status, dead to the world and its powers, alive to God and Christ, with all of one's sins forgiven and destined for glory, that will inevitably produce thanksgiving. And such an attitude of thanks will serve as a powerful deterrent to the inroads of the false teachers, as well as a stimulus to pray. So thankfulness here is not just a generic throw in, hey, be thankful. It's part of the message of the book. As you are thankful for what you have in Christ, it guards you against false teaching. As you are watchful for temptation. So prayer is a means of growing and drawing nearer to God and growing in grace and being kept from sin. And then thirdly, and this is really where Paul gives attention in these verses, we pray for the success of the gospel. 
That's the shift you see between verses 2 and 3. In verse 2, you you have this general admonition, pray. But in verse 3, Paul gets specific. He says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. And the open door, we still use that language today. It's a very common symbol for opportunity, for access. It's used often in the Bible, very often when referring to opportunities for evangelistic ministry. Notice how Paul says, pray that God will open a door for our message, for the message of the gospel. Pray for us, Paul says, that God will give us opportunities to preach. And in this prayer request, again, we see God's sovereignty and man's responsibility both on display. God is the one who sovereignly provides opportunities for the spread of the gospel. Let me read you a sequence of events from the book of Acts. Just listen to this from Acts 16. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Messiah and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You follow that chain of events here? Two times Paul says, let's go preach here. And God is the one who says no. Do not go there. He closes the door. But then in the night, Paul has this vision of the man in Macedonia saying, come and help us. And Paul concludes, God wants us to go preach the gospel there. God opened the door. He was in sovereign control of their opportunities to preach the gospel. And it was his wisdom, it was his grace guiding them to the right place to preach the word. That's God's sovereignty. And But then at the same time, what do we see? Paul is aware of his responsibility. I must avail myself of these opportunities. I must take every opportunity that God gives me to preach the gospel. That's why he says, pray for me, that I will open my mouth clearly as I should. The word has power to transform lives. It cannot be contained, but Paul knows. If I don't proclaim that word, people will perish. He asks in Romans 10, 14, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? 2 Corinthians 4, 3, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And finally, 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Woe to me! if I do not preach the gospel. Paul wanted to preach the gospel. He wanted to preach it everywhere, all the time. He wanted to go into those cities. But God said, don't go there. I'm going to open the door for you to go into Macedonia. But when he did open that door, Paul obeyed. And you know what happened? The church at Philippi was founded. And it was another step in the continuing spread of the gospel into the world. Brothers and sisters, let us pray that God will grant opportunities for the spread of the gospel. Our prayers are an essential aspect of that. We have teachers, we have ministers, we have missionaries, and they stand up and preach, and they stand up and proclaim. And that's great and good. God calls people to do that. But you know what else God calls all of us to do? To pray for their opportunities. And both are essentially important. You cannot have one without the other. Pray that God will give opportunities for the spread of the gospel and that ministers will take advantage of those. Remembering, by the way, the end of verse 4, Paul mentions his chains that nothing, not even those chains, can prevent the spread of God's powerful word. That is what we should pray for. Thirdly and finally, how do I learn to pray? And here I just want to give practical encouragement to pray. Again, I think we all know, even before we've been into this message, that we all should pray, that scripture tells us to pray. 
And perhaps God has encouraged us with the value of our prayers, but still, when it comes down to it, a lot of us have trouble actually praying. It, it can just seem like drudgery. Or maybe you go to pray and you just have no idea what to say. You, you, maybe you purpose to pray for five minutes, and that seems like an eternity when it comes to pray. Maybe you start praying and your mind starts thinking about work or school or what you have to do this evening. Is What can we do to actually get help in praying? I'm going to give you one practical suggestion that has paid off well in my own life personally, and that is to pray the Scriptures. To make the Scriptures the template for your own prayers. This is a, this is a common practice in Christianity. The Confession states that the Word of God is a rule to guide us in how to pray. And I think you'll find if you take the Scriptures, and especially the Psalms, and make that the guide for your prayers, you'll find a lot of help. We see it in the Bible when Jesus was on the cross. He prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a citation of Psalm 22.1. When the Sanhedrin tried to keep Peter and John from preaching and eventually released them, the Christians prayed, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? There's the citation from Psalm 145.6 and Psalm 2.1. The scriptures are filled with examples of Christians praying scripture. You don't have to be able to think of a whole lot of things to say. Pray the scriptures and you will find much help. You, you, you take a passage, again, particularly the Psalms, you read through it, you pray through it, and you make that your prayer. Now you have words to pray. Now you have guidance in what to say. Now you have an idea of the kinds of things that are good to pray. You have words, not just any words, God's words. The inerrant, authoritative words of God. It will focus your mind. It will give you a balance of requests. Okay, what kind of things should I be praying about? Pray through the Psalms. You'll cover all the bases. It'll warm your heart. You'll find encouragement. Your affections will be kindled. Your confidence will grow. Sometimes you go into the presence of God and you're like, Lord, would you please do this? Read the Psalms. They're they're going into God's presence and saying, Answer me when I call. How long, O Lord, until you do these things? Obviously, we can can become irreverent in the presence of God, but the Psalms give us a long way to go. They give us boldness in God's presence. God has made promises, and the authors are saying, Lord, you said you would do this. Would you please answer my prayers? They'll keep you fresh. They'll keep you specific. They'll even help you understand the Bible more. It will, it will help your soul to commune with God when you use the scriptures as your basis. And I'll close with this quote. This is from John Piper about this very practice. He says, if I try to pray for people or events without having the word in front of me guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. One is that I tend to be very repetitive from day to day and hour to hour, and I just pray the same things all the time. Another negative thing is that my mind tends to wander and I think instead about what I'm wearing or that there is a Venetian blind that is halfway open or that there is a siren out on the street and I'm wondering what is happening. I'm jerked all over the place by my inattentiveness. But the Bible holds my attention because I'm looking at it and reading it and it gives me biblical things to pray for, specific things that the Bible commends. I've said to people, you can pray all day if you pray the Bible, end quote. Now, you don't have to start with the ambitious goal of praying all day. But if you are having trouble praying, start praying the Scriptures. Pray through Colossians 4, 2 through 4, and you'll find yourself going deeper and longer, and it will bless your soul. Prayer, good for the Christian's life, and something that God has given us helps for. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your mercies. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And we thank you that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again to give us access into the presence of God. And that because of Christ, we can pray. We come in Jesus' name. And every day you bid us to come, to pour out our hearts before you, to make requests, to pray for the spread of the gospel, 
And because of Jesus, because you lived, died, and rose again, because you have given us righteousness, because you are the king of heaven and earth, we have authority, merit, and confidence behind those prayers. Lord, teach us the joy of prayer. Give us fresh starts in prayer. May prayer not become a nagging, guilt-laden activity that we do just to satisfy some spiritual checklist. Lord, give us a love for your presence. And help us to understand communion with you. And not to enter in to be heard with our much speaking or our great words, but just to simply and humbly pray to you and ask you to do the things you've promised to do. Deepen our communion with you and help us to love you. And Father, again, we pray today for the spread of the gospel in Roebuck and Spartanburg and beyond. We thank you for your mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.